Segments 39 and 40, Post-Main Sequence Evolution of Low-Mass Stars. This diagram shows the evolution of stars as they leave the main sequence to become red giants and then eventually white dwarfs. But how is this scenario put together? How do we understand how stars do this? Let's look at some of the details and then talk about the observational confirmation of this theoretical picture. Here's a picture of the Sun in its main sequence stage where the hydrogen burning is taking place at the middle and hydrogen rich unaltered material sits around that through which the energy is transferred to the outside of the star. At this point the star is about 1.4 million kilometers across. Stars are hot enough inside, about 10 million degrees, that fusion can replace the energy that they are losing. They're in a stable equilibrium at this point. If fusion is slowed down, they contract and heat up, causing fusion to speed back up until it balances the energy that they're losing. This stable equilibrium is what allows stars to last for a long time without changing very much. The sun will hardly change for about 10 billion years until it uses up most of the hydrogen in its core. When most of the hydrogen in the core of a main sequence star is turned into helium, fusion will stop in the core and the core will contract and heat up. The fusion will continue in a shell around the helium core and will generate more energy than the fusion in the core did originally. This extra energy going out from the core plus shell will make the envelope expand and cool off and that's what makes the red giant. So when the Sun becomes a red giant its radius will increase to about a half an AU, about half the distance from the Earth to the Sun, and it will become more than a hundred times more luminous than it is now. At that point, life will not be pleasant on the Earth. It will become extremely hot, the oceans will boil, and it will be very difficult for life as we know it to continue. The helium core of the Sun will continue to contract and heat up at this point, because helium burning takes much higher temperatures than hydrogen burning. When the temperature in the core reaches about 100 million degrees, about a million years after the Sun leaves the main sequence, the helium in the core will begin to fuse to make carbon. This is a picture of what the Sun will look like at this stage. On the left you see the Sun as it is now, and on the right you see the Sun as a red giant with a diameter that's very, very much larger than the original Sun, and you see the, the helium core surrounded by this very small hydrogen burning shell. When helium fusion starts generating energy in the core of a red giant, the core expands and hydrogen fusion in the shell around the core slows down. As a result, the total energy that's being generated and the, it, and the envelope is, is less, and so the envelope contracts and warms up a bit. But quite soon, all the helium in the core is converted into carbon and fusion stops. We'll explain the reason for this in, in just a minute. Then the core again contracts, surrounded now by two shells, one that's fusing helium into carbon and one that's making hydrogen into helium. The envelope again expands and cools off, so the star once again rises to higher luminosity and lower temperature in the HR diagram. Now, why does the helium burn so quickly? The reason is this. In a normal star, pressure in the gas is caused by the particles bouncing off of each other and the normal gas, the temperature determines the speed of the particles, so the higher the temperature, the higher the pressure. When you heat the gas up, the pressure goes up and that pushes things apart. But in a very dense gas of ele that includes electrons, so a gas that's ionized, quantum mechanics provides an additional reason for the electrons to move. There's something called the uncertainty principle that says if an electron is in a very small region of space, it has to move very rapidly so as not to overlap with other electrons. The consequence of this is that if a degenerate gas loses energy, the electrons don't slow down, so the pressure doesn't decrease. The pressure is no longer sensitive to temperature. So what happens is as you evolve from the main sequence uh, up uh, to, the, to becoming a red giant, and then finally uh, you begin burning helium, the pressure is, a, is the sum of a term that's normal thermal pressure, which is proportional to density times temperature, and another term which is only proportional to density. That rho in this equation is, is density. And when that term dominates, when you make the star hotter, the pressure doesn't go down. And as a result, the burning gets even more fierce. The temperature goes up higher and higher. And when the temperature goes up, 
the helium burning proceeds even more rapidly and you very rapidly run through the helium in the core. That's when you get to this stage where the core starts to expand and finally this degeneracy pressure is relieved. At that point the star drops down from position 6 to 7 in this diagram and the star starts to heat up. It then between 8 and 9 as the helium shell burning starts ascends, ascends back up the red giant branch. Well. This is kind of a story that I've told you at this point, but is stellar evolution just a theory, or is it even a scientific theory? For a hypothesis to be scientific theory, it must be testable. Almost all of stellar evolution, however, occurs so slowly that we can't watch it happen, at least not over a human lifetime. So our tests of stellar evolution must be indirect. The primary test involves observing stars in a star cluster, in a star cluster, we believe all the stars have formed at the same time, so they have the same age. By looking at stars of slightly different mass, we can get some idea of, of what's going on by comparing the properties of the stars and the stellar evolution models for stars of slightly different masses. And this predicts the pattern that stars of a fixed mass should have in an HR diagram as a function of age. So here we have a globular cluster. This is an older system with many, many stars in it. It's by looking at systems like this and placing these individual stars in an HR diagram that we get to test evolutionary theories for stars. So here's a model. Uh, here, here's the main sequence and a, and, and a very young cluster, what we think is a very young cluster, showing a bunch of stars at the at the cool end. These are low mass stars that haven't yet even reached the main sequence. And you see one star at the high end, a high mass star that's already left the main sequence, just as you're you're getting going. When you go to a system that's older, about a hundred million years, the very high mass stars are gone already. All the low mass stars have reached the main sequence, and you're starting to see intermediate mass stars turn off the main sequence and rise up to become red giants. As you go to even older systems, now a 4 billion year old system, even stars that are only a little bit more massive than the Sun have, have ascended the red giant branch. Stars are turning off of the main sequence and you see stars moving across horizontally back towards the main sequence as they're going to go off and become white dwarfs later. When the red giant has, contract, has a contracting carbon core and two fusion shells, it's generating so much energy that radiation pressure that is the pressure of the photons on the gas from the high energy light trying to, to get out of the star pushes away the envelope exposing the very hot star. star. This ultraviolet light also uh, heats up and ionizes the expelled envelope causing it to glow like the gas in our discharge lamps. This glowing envelope is what we call a planetary nebula because it looks somewhat like a planet through a tall small telescope. It actually has nothing to do with planets. This radiation pressure that pushes the envelope away has a significant effect. It also is, is an important effect in, in, in red giants and keeping their atmospheres extended. Uh, it's normally too, too small to measure, but in a red giant, or in this very last stage of red giants, it can become stronger than a red giant's gravity and actually pu puff off this, this outer envelope. That's why we wind up with these beautiful objects called planetary nebulae. On the left, you see a, the ring nebula where the, the very small white dot in the middle is the hot core of the star that's left over and this is the outer envelope that's been puffed off and then ionized. On the right you see another example and this one is quite asymmetric and this asymmetry has to do with the way the wind is shaped that pushes out the gas. What's left over, that little dense core that's left over, is what we call a white dwarf. Because this is supported by the by its very high density, it's supported by this electron degeneracy pressure, and because the pressure doesn't decrease when when uh, they lose energy, the core, this core, this white dwarf core, cannot contract, and so it doesn't have a chance to uh, contract and heat up again as the the hydrogen core did earlier. So it simply cools off. Fusion stop stops because you can't get hot enough to to fuse carbon into the next heavier element, and it never starts up again. This white dwarf, which will have a mass between about a half and one solar mass, starts out very hot, about 100,000 degrees, but gradually cools off. The sizes of these objects are about the size of the Earth, uh, uh, about uh, 
at 10 or 12,000 kilometers in diameter. So here's a, a comparison of the different sources. The sun, the sun on the left, a white dwarf on the right, and a red giant down below to just give you a feel for the different sizes. The density of the white dwarf is enormous. Remember we said the density of the sun is about the density of water, but the density of white dwarf instead of being one ton per cubic meter is one ton per cubic centimeter, so about a million times the density of the sun, about 16 tons per cubic inch. White dwarf stars are very, very stiff, and the stars will just cool off, moving parallel to the main sequence at constant radius then, towards lower and lower temperature, but below the main sequence because they're so small. Um, the interesting thing is, because the way degeneracy pressure works, the more massive a white dwarf is, the smaller it is. And it turns out that, that there's a limiting mass called the Chandrasekhar mass, which is about 1.4 times the mass of the sun. Objects that are more massive than that, this will collapse on themselves. They can't support themselves even with degeneracy pressure.